one of the things that I think we'll talk about in, in a moment is origins uh, of art making and the sort of cognitive advantage it gave early human beings and how art plays a role in the resilience of cultures as they come and they go, particularly in this period, you know, this golden age followed by the collapse of Europe. If indeed art has since the dawn of, you know, art making in the caves functioned among many things to provide for human resilience to cultural stresses. Uh, stresses can tear cultures apart. Art seems in some way across the ages to provide a way to make sense of that and to have people reorganize and create a new level of, of order, whatever that may be. Now, here in, in 1900 Vienna, in this golden age, um, art was starting to create links between domains of knowledge which were not made before. And particularly understanding the role the viewer plays in looking at art and how art communicates to culture. Uh, you mentioned Alois Regal as a critical thinker in that area. Tell us yes. about him. So you, you put Vienna into a very interesting context. Vienna uh, was going through a fabulous phase at this time. Um, so uh, around um, 1860, uh, Franz Josef, the emperor of Austria-Hungary, decided as a present to the citizens of Vienna, he would tear down a sort of a, a, a barricade, a wall that surrounded the inner city, and that gave the land for building the Ringstrasse, this wonderful boulevard, this magnificent boulevard. And he, a number of major architects were recruited, like Otto Wagner, uh, who built buildings on the Ringstrasse. Uh, and so Vienna became to be a very beautiful city. Uh, also, travel restrictions were lifted on Jews and other minorities so they could move freely throughout the empire. So ambitious young people came to Vienna, uh, artists, writers, painters, uh, you know, all kinds of people came. Uh, and that had a tremendous impact. Uh, Vienna was a relatively small city, um, and it had these cafe houses where people met and talked to each other. So scientists would meet, artists would meet journalists, and they talked together. Moreover, there were wonderful salons, and one particularly important salon was run by Bertha Zuckerkandl. Her husband, Emil Zuckerkandl, was a major person in academic medicine, a fine anatomist, and he was Rokotansky's right-hand person. So he got a lot of the artists interested in biology, okay? Um, so the idea came that these people were talking to one another, and a person who really catalyzed the next move was, as you indicated, Alois Rigo. Alois Rigo felt that art history was gonna die unless it becomes more scientific. It was just too descriptive. And he thought that the science it should align itself to with psychology. And he implicitly had a reductionist approach like you and I would take right. to life. <laughs> he said, you can't take all of art. Let's focus on one thing. Let's focus on the beholder's share. Yeah. Most people don't realize that that's a part of the painting. Because unless a beholder responds to Delbruch Bauer, it's not meaningful. Now, obviously, it's meaningful to the painter, but it becomes even more meaningful. And a major part of his purpose is to please other people with the creativity of his work. So he thought that understanding the nature of the viewer's response to work of art, uh, what he called the beholder share, was critical next step in linking science and art. Yeah. And two of his disciples, Ernst Chris, who later became a famous psychoanalyst mm -hmm. and who I knew very well, and Ernst Gombrich, who I only met briefly, both became interested in this problem. And Chris started out in saying, when you and I look at Adele Blochbauer, we're looking at the identical painting from pretty much the same perspective, but you and I will see somewhat different things in it. Right. Why is that so? And that is because a work of art has a certain amount of ambiguity in it, and you and I will interpret it in different ways. Moreover, you bring a history of experience to this work of art that's different from mine. Exactly. You bring a history of knowledge of art that is different than mine. We each bring a different life story right. to it. And we interpret the world in the context of our life experience. We interpret art the way we interpret everything else. We interpret it in context. And 
Gomrich was fascinated with this idea, and he said, my God, if this is what's going on, then the viewer is recreating in their own brain, in their own mind, some of the creative experience that the artist is having. And both Chris and Gomrich realized that the brain is a creativity machine. They began to realize not only when you look at a work of art, but if you just hold up a bottle, right. you don't take a picture of that bottle and your brain sees it, you deconstruct the bottle and reconstruct it in the brain. Right. So the brain is in every sense a creativity machine. And they began to play with illusions where you could trick the brain. Right. You know? In fact, the artist is tricking the, the brain all the time. Yeah. He is tricking it less than some artists, but you're always painting on a flat right. surface. And until 1880, the whole history of Western art right. was to create more and more illusions about three-dimensionality. One of the things as a painter uh, I experience is exactly this. There's always a kind of private joke that I'm playing with. Sometimes it's sexy, sometimes it's just silly, but it's a private thing that is going on almost not with effort. Uh, it's just happening as I interact sure. with the surface. And you know, one of the things you wrote about and I think comes out of Regal is this notion that the brain, mind, art making of the artist, somehow through the mirror neuron system or memory, activates a creative you know, response to the work. So the, the viewer is actually making the art, right. or, or as you recreating say, recreating, recreating the art. A work of art. And it's it's different. a different level of creativity, yes. but it is a level of creativity. You know. And we're tremendously creative people, and yeah. probably you know, genuine creativity, that is creativity that influences other people, comes out of this intrinsic yes. creative and capability that, in, of the In brain. my book, The Art Imperative, The Secret Power of Art, it was that sort of putting together the brain science, the culture, the history, the social connectedness, the uh, social ability to survive chaos by reconnecting and remaking, that we socially do something parallel to what the brain does with every work of art. You make a, a, an interesting point that I would not thought about before. Um, when we look at a work of art, um, we enjoy it a great deal for its intellectual content, its emotional content, its aesthetic content, color combination. But it, it may very well be that we also enjoy it because of this creative process we're undergoing. It's very pleasurable yes. to have an idea I can have the most trivial little idea. I was telling you before about the little idea that I had for the Passover Seder last night. It thrills the hell out of me. It's, a, it's a, you know, putting together two or three simple facts and seeing them in a somewhat different way that you haven't saw, seen before and that perhaps other people may not have seen before is very, very pleasurable to yes. oneself. You know, and when you bring up the idea of pleasure, it also, and you've written about this, um, beauty. Uh, one of the things that art consistently is, we look at those Kate paintings, they're beautiful. You know, you could get a lot of people to draw horses on the ceilings that are not beautiful and not, <laughs> not going to be very interesting. But, and, and beauty doesn't necessarily have to be the kind of traditional beauty. You know, the shark in the tank of Damien Hirst has a kind of awesome Herzl. beauty yeah. in itself. And I think as you write about, you know, beauty, ugliness are perceived by different parts of the brain. Uh, can you talk a little bit well, about that? Well, I think, that? Let, let me just elaborate on it because Regal was very important here. Uh, when when um, Klimt was attacked for his uh, university murals because he depicted the medical school of dealing with death and things like this, um, people said, you know, this art is not beautiful. Uh, and art historians came to his defense by saying, the function of art is to convey truth, yes. and sometimes truth, truth is, is not, not beautiful. beautiful. So it's the integrity of the art that's important. Yes. Uh, we can get pleasure out of art, you know, even though it may not mean Goya, war scenes, but realistic depiction of what, you know, brutality people are capable of. And in some way, those, let's just call them the ugliness or the confrontation with the, the realities of, the of life. Realities of life. It helps us make sense, kind of a virtual practice. So you could face life. Absolutely. You go look at that Absolutely. shark in a tank, and you say, well, thank God I'm not in the water with it. 
uh, but your life can be like a shark sometimes. Yes, yes. I mean, it's obviously one of the many functions of art is to allow you to experience situations that you would not be able to experience, nor would you want to experience something. Right.